Well, good evening and welcome to this midweek talk. I uh, hope you're doing okay. I hope you've got your cup ready. I've got my mini eggs uh, mug as it's just after Easter. Oh, very good. Um, this evening we're going to uh, look at Moses again. We're going to kind of continue the story. If you've watched uh, thus far, uh, you'll know that we've uh, we'd reached the the Passover, and uh, that's that's where I want to pick it up because you know we thought about last time how they had to prepare for the Passover. And after all of those huge plagues that had affected so much of the land uh, around Egypt, it was time for the final plague. And onto the scene hops and jumps a lamb. And it's amazing, isn't it? That, that picture that after all of that kind of devastation of hail and locusts and everything else uh, that had taken place, as we go to the final plague, here is a lamb hopping on to the scene. Recently I was driving along uh, with, uh, with my son and, and there was some lambs uh, hopping and jumping really quite high and very playful in the field. You could see their parents kind of watching over them. And what we get in Exodus 12 verse 3 is this, Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. Then verse 6, Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the fourteenth day of the first month. So each home had time to play with the lamb, to look after the lamb, but then we get this. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. I was thinking, you know, the picture here, isn't there, of Jesus who came, uh, you know, that baby that we have at Christmas, like the baby lamb in a sense, kind of dependent upon Mary and Joseph, and then living on earth for 33 years or so, and then he was slaughtered. His blood was smeared all over the cross. And when we, pass, and when we put our faith and trust in Jesus and his death, then his blood covers us, covers our sins, and God's judgment will pass over us. And that's just an amazing picture, isn't it? But then what takes place here for Moses is that final plague, that death of the firstborn, that it is, falls across the whole land, and only those that were under the blood of the Lamb were safe. And it says, in every home in Egypt, someone died. This was the kind of final straw, if you like, uh, for Pharaoh. And in Exodus 12, verse 30, we get these words, Pharaoh and all his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There's not a single house where someone had not died. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Get out, he ordered. Leave my people. Take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you've requested. Take your flocks and herds as you've said and be gone. Go. But bless me as you leave. An interesting uh, part. But all the Egyptians urged the people of Israel to get out of the land as quickly as possible. For they thought we will all die. And verse 36. The Lord caused the Israelites to look favourably upon the Israelites. And gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. And so the Israelites leave. And as they leave, they kind of plunder, the, they take or a lot of the Egyptians' stuff. But it tells us that at this point there was around 600,000 men plus women and children. It's an incredible picture, isn't it? You know, 430 years earlier or so as they'd entered the land because of Joseph uh, and that famine, they were a family of 70 or so. But how God had blessed them, even in those years of slavery, they'd multiplied hugely. Now they were a, a nation, a people, and we see that promise of Ab to Abraham 
of his descendants and stars and sand and all of that being seen. But we know this wasn't the end, was it, of them coming out of Egypt because Pharaoh once again changes his mind. But we also see what God does because in chapter 13 verse 21 we see something of the spectacle of what took place. It says, The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillow of cloud, provided light at night with a pillow of fire, and it allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. So on the one hand, you've got God with his people, leading and directing and protecting but then on the other hand, you've got Pharaoh beginning to change his mind. And then we get the words, you know, chapter 14, verse 10, uh, of them approaching. You know, he'd got his best, 600 best chariots and all, every other chariot that he could muster. Uh, and they went after them. He realised he was letting all his slaves go. So he wanted them back. And it says this, even with you know, God with them so visibly, it says, when the Pharaoh approached, this is chapter 14, verse 10, the people of Israel looked up and panicked. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? Of course, like a real wave, isn't it? And then they said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. When you think there was this pillar of fire, uh, at night, there was this cloud by day. They're still petrified, aren't they, of Pharaoh, of seeing, you know, even after seeing all these plagues and what God has done and the power and the awe and the wonder. It's Moses who has to stand up to them and say, you know, keep calm, be still, you know, be still and know that I am God. You know, he's looking to God and saying, be still, God is with us. But interesting in the next verse is God says, actually, don't stay still. Get moving. Verse 15, he says, Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff. Raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. Then my glory is displayed through them. All Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. For one final time, God's judgment was going to fall on the Egyptians. So let me read what happens next. Then the angel of God who had been leading the people of Israel moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps and as darkness fell the cloud turned to fire lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. Moses raised his hand over the sea and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. What an amazing thing that must have been. Then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots and charioteers, chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels. He made their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here, away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord's fighting for them against Egypt. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again. Then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea and the water rushed back into its usual place. 
The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. Then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh. Of all the Egyptians who chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground, as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. It's just an amazing story, isn't it, of what took place, the power of God. And yet, you know, as we've just gone through Easter, we, we've thought about what Jesus has done for us, that, you know, Moses raised that wooden staff up and Jesus was raised up on that wooden cross. And just like, you know, Moses saw the Red Sea part so that they could cross, as Jesus was lifted up, he defeated sin and he opened the way for us to come to God. The Israelites went from slavery to freedom. And through the cross, we go from slavery to sin to freedom with God. And the story of Moses is, is in the book of Exodus. And Exodus is all about, you know, that, that coming out of somewhere. And Jesus has brought about a second greater exodus through his blood. And he brings us out of sin and death and all of that into a relationship with God. And we know that this is seen in baptism. That beautiful picture of baptism that links with what Jesus has done, but also this picture here of Moses, you know, as we go through the waters of baptism, we're symbolising that we've gone away from our old way of living, that slavery to sin, that under the influence, the power of the devil. And like, you know, if pictured in a sense like Pharaoh, and that we've come out of that way of living into a new life, a new life with God, where God is our saviour, is our Lord. The old has gone, the new has come, and it's all because Jesus was lifted up on that cross for us to take our sin so that we can go through into that relationship with God from slavery and sin to forgiveness and freedom with God. The Lamb of God, you know, Jesus entered the world as a humble baby. But his death on the cross has changed everything. It's just such an amazing picture of God's love for us. Why don't we pray as we think about these words. Lord, this Easter time we give you thanks for the new exodus in your blood. Thank you for our freedom from sin that you bought for us on the cross. Lord, thank you that Jesus was willing to be lifted up so that he could pour out that gift of relationship with you. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the most amazing gift of being with you, of living in relationship with you every day. Lord, would you help us to walk by faith with grateful hearts for all that we have in you. And Lord, would you keep our eyes fixed on you? Lord, we know that there's greater promised land ahead. We know this is not the end here on earth, but one day our eternal journey in your eternal promised land will begin and our eyes will gaze on your glory and your light and your beauty forever. Lord, would you help us each day to keep lifting our eyes to you and all the hope and promise that we have in and through Jesus. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you found that helpful. It's bye for now. God bless.